Thank you, Rabbi Alon. It's always an honor to come here to Great Neck, to this beautiful shul and wonderful people. We are now 48 hours before Matan Torah, Shchak Shavuot, the holiday of Matan Torah. Uh, this lecture, I was asked that it should be Bezrat Hashem. It's a list of things to read here. All right, so it's Leilu Nishmat Shafika Batsalcha, Shlomo Ben Sara, Shmuel Ben Adina. Also, Lerefuat Ruven Ben Avraham, and Leilu Nishmat, Leatzlachat David, William Snava, Batsim Chamimi, Lerefuat Shlema, and also Lerefuat Shlema, Batsheva, Batmenu Chamintia, and Leilu Nishmat, Ilana Batnajat, and Shaili Ael Batmoran. Little girl that just passed away, Shaili Batmoran. Parents came from Israel. She had a horrible cancer. They were here a month, and I went back, and just when they arrived, they had to bury her. Lo aleinu. So many tragedies I hear every day, it's hard to believe. So many problems, hard to digest what's going on. And I can say that 27 years ago, when I started to give a lecture, to give lectures, Also, when I started to give lecture 27 years ago, I can see that every year the problems become worse. It's obvious, unfortunately. We are now before Chag Matan Torah. It's a little bit of a mystery to me why we call it Chag Matan Torah, because we didn't really get the Torah in Shavuot. If you know the story in Parashat Yitro, it describes how we receive the Torah. I mean, Ma'amad Ar Sinai, I should say. Vayi b'yom ha-shlishi, b'yot ha-boker, and the third day after Hashem prepared Moshe, we call it Shlosha Yemei Agbala, which we are in them right now. Three days before Shavuot, Hashem said to Moshe, make sure no one has relation. No one should have, uh, no one should, uh, you know, be impure. Everyone, you know, should go to the mikveh, wash their clothes. Why three days you cannot be, cannot be with your wife? Because after intimacy, three days the sperm is still inside. Therefore, there is always a way that it can impurify her again. Even if she went to the mikveh right away after, they could still come out and do, you know, and even purify the woman. So therefore, three days before, after three days, the sperm is expired. It cannot make the woman impure. So therefore, three days before, you have to purify yourself. Also, the clothes. In the old days, there was Ezra Sofer, he made Takana that everyone was with his wife, has to go to the mikveh right after. The problem was that in those days, remember, there was no beautiful mikveh and marble and heating and hot water, you press a button, everything works out for you. People had to go to the lakes, freezing wind, winter, snowing, hail, rain, you know, and they have to go in the middle of the night, there are snakes, there's all kinds of other problems. As it is, nobody wanted to go to the mikveh. And even if it was a big hole in the ground at night with some lamp, you have to go inside and sometimes there used to be big snakes, like the time of the Babasali in Morocco, there was a huge snake in the mikveh. No woman wanted to go to the mikveh until the Babasali went in and brought out the snake. And, and showed everyone, don't worry, now you can go to the mikveh. To go to the mikveh was a nightmare, not like today, the 20 million dollar mikveh. And people, I'm not sure if it's clean. The Hilton Hotel with all the, whatever the kids do over there, and all the oil and tanning, and all the hair of the people, and all the other dirt, and the sand that comes with the wind, 
אז ממש צ'יקן סופ. צ'יקן סופ הנה הילטון או שרתון או תל, they love to dive in. מקווה that is clean so much with chlorine, they clean the site, make sure it's ממש 100% clean and the filters constantly cleaning and nobody goes there with oil and tanning and all the rest and everybody takes a shower before they go into the mikveh they must take a shower so the water is cleaner than the water you get from the faucet to drink in a mikveh in a mikveh there's yetzer hara that's why all of a sudden they make excuses in Hilton Hotel there's no yetzer hara to go in front of all the men there no yetzer hara, the opposite the yetzer hara convinces you to go there so it's all in the mind. Anyway, go back to what I started. So Ezra Sofer made a takana, made a decree that no one, after they had intimacy, they must go to the mikveh. The problem is, because it was such a nightmare to go to the mikveh, people start, stop to have relationship. Nobody wants to be with his wife. As much as they wanted it, thinking about what they have to go through after, we're making people not having intimacy, and there's less kids, and there's no poor vu. So we, we started to lose more than we gain. You want to gain purity, that people are pure after they were together, and at the same time you make thousands of people not being with their wife, it destroys the Shlom Bayit, it destroys the future of the Jewish nation, and there are less Jews born in the world. Obviously it's against Hashem's will. And they saw that the public cannot maintain such a decree and they canceled it. But we learn that the, the best possible way after the intimacy is to go to the mikveh and get pure. That's really the best thing. And today when it's so easy, no excuses, why not? Anyway, so Hashem said to Moshe three days preparation for accepting the Torah. It's the most important event in the history. Nothing so substantial ever happened in the world that God came and spoke to more than three million people in a public event and everybody heard his voice. It happened only once and will not happen again until the Mashiach come. There are, there's going to be wonderful things in the world. But until then, it was the most substantial thing that ever happened. You have to understand there's 80,000 religion and cults, all of them fake, that came after Judaism. And all of them started with the story of one faker and one liar. Now one time they brought any witnesses to their fairy tales. No one, not Muhammad, not Mary, not Buddha. It was a story of a faker, made up a story. They asked him, who witnessed that? No one, I was alone. Buddha, you had an enlightenment? Wow, wonderful. Anybody witness it? No, I was alone. Mary, you had a dream? God came to you in a dream and made you pregnant? Mazal tov. <laughs> but we have a problem here. Anyone saw it? No, in a dream. How can anyone see it? But how can God come to a married woman and make her pregnant and make a kid that is illegitimate? Mamzer. God could not go to a single girl? Free? Huh? And bring a kid from her that the kid would be legit? Why has to go to a married woman who just got married? Why is it? In a Torah, it's death penalty to go with a married woman. It's a death penalty. That means it's a despicable act to cheat with a married woman. For both of them, it's death penalty, the man and the woman. So from all the possibilities, God would choose something that is worse than murder? How dumb you could be. Ooh, you're talking to the world. Two billion people follow this fairy tale. Half of America they own. Why? The world is full of foolish people. Nothing is new under the sun. Then you come to Muhammad. Muhammad, you got the Quran? <laughs> wow, mazal to, mabruk. Mabruk, ya Muhammad. Who watched that you, you alone with Angel Gabriel giving you the Quran? No, I was alone. Nobody saw it. Mustafa, Said, Abdallah. No one saw it? No, I was alone. Of course you were alone. Because you are making up a story. It would be a lot more convincing if 50 Arabs saw Muhammad getting the Quran, no? But why Muhammad didn't bribe them? What's the problem? He probably had 50 cousins. I will get all of them. Hey, Said, Mustafa, 
Muhammad, Mahmoud, come here, all of you. Each one of you get a hundred bucks and learn this text. What's this? Learn how you saw me getting the Quran from Angel Gabriel. But you didn't get the Quran. Who's good here? Abal. Shtok, what are you talking about? Be quiet. You're supposed to learn it like it happened. Okay, no problem. I'm, that's what I'm paying you for. To testify a false testimony. Your job is to all of you swear. Say, walla bismillah, walla la la. I swear on my life. The angel came down and gave Muhammad, our cousin, he gave him the Quran. And we all fell down. Why Muhammad didn't bring 50 Arabs and bribe them? What's the big deal? It would be a lot more convincing when 50 witnesses claim that the angel handed the Quran into your hand and nominated you to be a prophet. Why didn't bring? He didn't want to be a hostage in the future that will come to blackmail him. Hey, Muhammad, you think uh, you're making millions, you became a prophet, everyone bow down to you, everybody gives you a donation and you threw us 100 bucks. I want 100,000 right now, I need to buy a house. Why you come to me? You're not, uh, you're not giving me 100,000? I'll tell everyone how you fake the story. He you know, one day they turn against him. You bribe the witnesses, one day they're going to come and, and want some more money. Once you're, getting, you're being blackmailed and you cooperate, assume that they will return again and again and again. He didn't want this problem, so he came, I was alone. So every one of the fake religion, there's always a story of one man, except our story, which is the only truth, that there were millions of people, they came out of Egypt, seven weeks later we stood at Mount Sinai, and that's what described in Parashat Yitro. In the morning, very early, Hashem said to Moshe, gather all the Jews and bring them to Mount Sinai. And they, they already knew that they have three days of preparation, meaning tomorrow morning, we have to go to Mount Sinai and hear God speaking to us. And what did they do? Snored. What? Hey, Mo Yosef, Moshe, get up. What are you sleeping right now? Listen, leave us alone. What happened? It's Ben Azmani. <laughs> we can sleep until nine. There's Minyan at nine. That's why we have to stay up on Shavuot every year for so many years to correct the mistake they did. You're about to have a meeting with God and you're going to sleep? How can it be? That's the, the source of the Minag, came from the Shlach Kadosh 500 years ago. He lived in Sfat with the Ariya Kadosh. Now we have to stay all night, all night and learn Torah. That means Saturday night, Saturday during the day, make sure you have a good nap sleep three, four hours, that you don't have excuses. And on Motzei Shabbos, which is Saudat Yom Tov, don't eat too much. Not too much gondi, and not gourmet sabzi, and none of this. A little bit lighter. Why? Because you eat a lot of meat, you fall asleep. You eat a light meal, no problem. You're up all night, good cup of coffee, you come to the shul, and you learn all the way to the morning. Next, it's very early. Five o'clock, you're done already. By seven, you're done. You come home, you do a dairy meal, kiddush, dairy meal, some good burekas, maybe some cheesecake. Then you go to sleep. You rest. You get up, you learn Torah again. In the evening, another meal. This time, gondi, gourmet, whatever you like. No problem. So remember, when Moshe finally woke them up and brought them into the acceptance of the Torah, when God came down to the mountain, he was with voice of shofar, loud siren, fire everywhere, the floor is shaking, the voice of the shofar is getting stronger by the minute. They all got so scared. It was such a scary event. Why? Because scary works. Too much relaxation doesn't work. When you see God is very powerful and very scary and everything is shaking and smoke and fog and fire and siren and all of a sudden, boom, like an explosion. I am the God that took you out of Egypt. Everybody froze. Their blood froze. 
you should not have any other God but me. By then, by the second sentence, the second commandment, they all died. Clinical death. The souls came out of the body. The Midrash say, angels came and brought back all the souls and pushed them back into the body. And they all came back to life. Why? The, the panic, the fear was so high, they couldn't live. They died from fear. I once asked a question, why did God have to give us the Torah in such a scary event? Why not playing a little Mozart? You know, maybe Beethoven. Something, mixture of some nice classical music, smell of jasmine in the air, right? Nothing is shaking, no shofar, no siren, no fire, nice breeze. Huh? Beautiful. And I am the God that took you out of Egypt, my children, because I love you so much, and I'm only here to give, and you should never be afraid. I'm with you. I'm very positive. Whatever you like, you can do. Whatever you like. I'm a good father. I allow you, my children, to do whatever you wish to do. You like my Torah? Nice. You don't like it? Also nice. Either way, you're going to go to heaven. You have nothing to worry about. Why I didn't do it this way? Why I had to be so strict? Like they say in America, fanatic. Why? The answer, because he is the best psychologist. He created psychology. He created the mind of the people. He created all the positive and negative traits. And he's the manufacturer of the machine called human being. Who knows what's better for your Mercedes? You or the German engineer who made it up? Who knows what kind of gasoline this car needs? And when you have to do oil change? And when you have to do this? And when you have to do that? The driver? Or Hans from Berlin? Huh? I just made it up. Hans. It's a good German name. Why? Hans! He is the owner, he is the manufacturer, he is the engineer. He planned everything. And if God wants us to keep the Torah and he brought us the Torah with such panic and fear, it means there's no better way than that. That's why the speakers that put fear in the mind of their listeners are the most successful in making Balei Tshuva always. Always. I can give you a list of people, I don't want to offend the others. Those who spoke strong in the last generation and in this generation made thousands of Baalei Tshuva every year. And those who kiss up to the wicked people and hug them and give them love and all kinds of stories, not one of them became Baal Tshuva. I'm telling you from experience of 27 years. Just not working. They may, not, they may like him very much, they may build him a building in Great Neck for $40 million because it's pleasant and it's nice to be around him. But everyone will remain Mechalel Shabbat forever and come with the car on Shabbat and with his Goya wife and with the pork that he's going to eat on Yom Tov. Why? Because the rabbi never told him, hey, wake up, what are you doing? There's a purpose for life. You came here to be righteous, not to stay wicked. Why? I don't want to intimidate anyone. But that's your job. The job of the rabbi is to intimidate his listeners for their own good. That's a kosher rabbi, to shake them up. That's what Moshe did. For the years he spoke Musar to the people. That's why many people didn't like him. Not everybody likes to hear the truth. Some people appreciate the truth and some people hate it. Is that a reason for the speaker to twist the truth and modify it because the wicked people don't like it? That's pure stupidity. The opposite, a speaker that the lefties and the liberals and all the other wicked people hate him, that's the greatest honor in his resume. When the gays and the Mechalele Shabbat and the liberals and the thieves and all the other corrupted people love the rabbi, check him well probably one of them. 
When they hate him, very good. That means he does what Hashem wants him to do. That's how it's always been. Not just today. Every generation was the same case. Rambam was very good. He had a lot of people opposed him. The Ramchal also. Rabbeinu Yona also. Everyone. Everyone who spoke the truth had wicked people fighting them. It's nothing new. Rav Ovadia Yosef. In our days. Do you know what the newspapers and the TV of all the lefty media did to him? There's not one day without spilling his blood. Not one day. Did he stop working? Did he care? Did he ever change the truth? No. He, the do, we, we ever say in Israel, Aklavim nofchim veashayara overet. When you walk, the dogs are barking. They want to rip you up. The dogs are barking and you continue to go through. Who cares about their barking? We have a mission to do. So going back to what I started, after the second commandment, everybody got so scared, they started to scream to Moshe, you can read it in Parashat Yitro, please, please, don't let God continue to talk to us, we're so scared. You go up to the mountain, and you speak to him. And everything he wants, we are going to do. First we do, and then we will understand. And Moshe had to cheer them up. No, don't worry. God did not come here to harm you. He's only testing you. Those are the words, word by word. He's only testing you. He wants you to keep the Torah. It did not help. Moshe had to go up to the mountain. So, so what Torah we got in Shavuot? The answer is none. We only heard the first two commandments. That was the, an attempt to give us the Ten Commandments. Even that did not succeed. After we heard the first two verses from the Ten Commandments, the first two, everybody died. There was a big panic. And Moshe went up to the mountain and he came down after 40 days and found them dancing around the golden calf with the Ten Commandments. Meaning up to that moment, we didn't even get the Ten Commandments. Nothing. It was only Muhammad al-Sinai on Shavuot. Only. Nothing else. When he saw them dancing, he broke the commandments. The commandments were made from a very expensive stone. Sapphire. One little sapphire today can be millions of dollars. Imagine six tfachim. You know six tfachim by six tfachim? This is a tefach, my palm. So what is it, like five inches, six inches? So it's like 36 inches by 36 inches. And it's all unbelievable. It's all made from pure sapphire. It's worth trillions, billions, who knows how much. By the way, that's how Moshe became very, very rich. From the broken commandments, the value of the, of the commandments were very, very high. The first commandments were made by God, the tablets. He actually got the stone and he designed it and he wrote the commandments on the stone. It was 100% made in, not China, made in heaven. 100%. When he had to prepare the second commandment, it's not the same. Whenever you commit a sin for the first time, even though you repent and you start fresh, it will never be the same like before the sin. Never. The punishment can be waived, but the reality will never change. It will never change. I'll give you an example. A woman, she was a young single girl and she went and committed a sin with a single guy before she got married. Now, she's not kept anymore, that's it. When she's gonna go on Shiduchim, she's gonna have to say that she was already with someone before. Even though she repented, she became very righteous and very modest, nobody can return the reality to what it used to be. Her value, according to the Torah, in the old days, 99.9% .9 of the men would not wanna marry her, ever. Even by the Goim, it was like this. By some Goim, it's still like this, like some Arabs. If a woman was with another man, that's it. No, no Ahmed wants her. And no Said and no Mustafa. By them, it remained the same. 
Unfortunately, by us, as we speak, you have thousands of gays walking in Jerusalem. This is who we became. Then we wonder why the Arabs taking over Israel and killing us and destroying us mentally and physically. By them, there's never going to be a gay parade. If there's going to be a hundred gays walking any country in the world of Arabs, in less than a minute they'll be all shot and get killed or burned alive. Now one person will allow such thing. By them they will never put an advertisement there is a gay party or a gay marriage. By them no one will ever come to a gay marriage and scream Mazal Tov with a yarmulke on his head. They don't have liberals from the university here in Manhattan that pretend to be religious. They don't have this garbage by them. As filthy as they are, as murderer as they are, unfortunately we became worse than them and we're paying the price. Because by Hashem it's all about justice. As filthy as they are, as thirsty as they are for blood, as cruel as they are, they come to a baby in a crib and slaughter his neck like real monster or take an axe and stick it to a man in his head in front of his child, just like Nazis. And we became worse than them, overall, on a scale. Yes, we Jews don't do things like this. Jews don't take an axe and split someone's head open. I don't think it ever happened in history. Jews don't come and slaughter a baby in a crib. It never happened. Jews don't put bombs and blow up people. They are not terrorists. They are not... Bl thirsty for blood like the Ishmaelim are. No. But there are other things. They are very bad when it comes to killing. And we are good when it comes to killing. But there are other things. They are, when it comes to modesty, they became more modest than us, and that's unheard of. They learn about modesty from us. And look what happened to us. Today, Hashem took the biggest Baal Tshuva of the generation, perhaps in history, and I'm not exaggerating. Rabbi Uri Zohar passed today at 86 years old. He is the biggest Baal Tshuva of our generation. He was a movie star, a producer, a TV host. He was in TV the star of all the secular Israelis. He was so good and so talented in the nonsense of those television stuff that even in Hollywood they offered him here, they offered him a contract. But he was on the way to become a Baal Tshuva, leave the wealth, leave the glory, the fake glory, being the most famous person in show business in Israel, making millions, living the life, with all the musicians and all the other movie stars, he was always on top. His movies had very high rating. In one day, he dumped everything to the garbage and made a turn 180 degrees and started to go to Yeshiva in Yerushalayim and sit and learn Torah. And from then on, for more than 40 years, he was sitting from morning to night, learning non-stop, became a big Talmud Chacham, a big tzaddik, denounced all the garbage movies and other things he ever did, and was a fundraiser for Lev Leachim, which put thousands of Jewish kids, moved them from public school into yeshivot in Israel and did all kinds of other good things. He was the, the face of the organization. Came many, many times to America and collected money for them. And with that money we save who knows, who knows how many thousands of souls. But the most incredible thing about him was that he gave up all the wealth and sat in a tiny one-bedroom storage, not even an apartment. So small, size of the bathroom here. And they came to interview him, the secular people what he used to be, with a beautiful mansion on a beach, in Jaffa, when today you need 30 million shekel to buy a house there, and moved into a storage so simple, so old, and he said, I'm the happiest person in the world. Why? Because everything I want, I have. I don't want the garbage I used to want. Now I'm really happy. 
My cousin, which is also my rabbi, who also made me bal tshuva, is his son-in-law. He spoke today in a funeral, where many thousands of people went to the funeral today. At the same time, there was such a holy thing in Jerusalem, in Givat Shaul. There was the filthiest thing on the other side of town with all these gays and all the other psychos walking around in the street naked, doing all kinds of acts of Sodom. They get angry when you call them Sotim. You know what's the meaning of the word Sote in Hebrew? No. What does it mean, Sote? Sote min aderech. What does it mean? Getting off the path. You have a path, straight path. When you go off the path, you fall on the side, or you take the wrong path, you are called Sote. A married woman who begins to have relationship with someone that is not her man. How does the Torah call her? Isha Sota. Sota is for female, Sote is for male. Sotim is plural. They attack me a lot this week in the Israeli television and prime time news. I was all over the screens in Israel this week. There was not one screen in Israel that didn't see my face. Big. They are so obsessed to try to destroy me, these lefties, that even when they were talking about the chief rabbi of Israel, something to do with meat, kashrut of uh, bringing, uh, bring, uh, giving, giving a permit to many other rabbis to be able to slaughter animals, that it's not going to be monopoly to make the prices of the meat cheaper. That was a whole different article. Instead of the face of Rav Yitzchak Yosef, the son of Rav Ovadia, the chief rabbi, they put my face. My friend called me, I didn't know you became the chief rabbi of Israel. I said, don't worry, they're so obsessed from me attacking the prime minister and the other wicked people. They are so angry that they already forgot to change the picture from the previous article. So then I spoke in, a, in an interview yesterday in the TV. There's one Rasha, Smolani Arur. So he's interviewing me. And in the end, after I crushed him to pieces, in the end he said, so you don't want to apologize to anything you've been saying against the prime minister and against Lieberman? So I answer him, not only I don't want to apologize, I have nothing to kiss up to you people. Like meaning, who are you that you're going to try to force me what to say, what not to say? That was the heat of the moment. That right away triggered tens of thousands of messages. Very good. Why? Because they force you to surrender to them. They want to put you on your knees. That's the way of, they are, these lefties. You have to see how they threaten me that they're going to arrest me when I will arrive to Israel. But you want to hear why they want to arrest me? I don't know if you're going to cry or laugh. I don't know how you're really going to laugh. I one time gave a lecture about Pinchas. Parashat Pinchas. In Parashat Pinchas, we have one Rasha, Nasi Shevet Shimon, Zimri Ben Salu. Right? You know that story. He met a Goya, princess, high class Goya, Kozvi Batsur, a Midianit, from Midian, princess, pre president of a tribe in Israel, a Jew, bringing a high class Goya into the camp. He doesn't go to Midian to make scenes with her or hide in a desert. He brings her into the community, in front of Moshe, in front of everyone. Everybody standing and crying, and he brings her into his tent when they're all demonstrating outside. So I said in my lecture, the Satan at that time was mekatreg, instigate very much against the Jewish people, that nobody stops it. Until Pinchas took a spear, stuck it in his stomach and hers together, lifted both of them up. That's one of the miracles that were done to him and brought them up just like shish kebab in a Persian restaurant. You know those big kebabs that they have? He picked them both up and brought them out. <coughs> and at that time, the anger of Hashem went down from 100% to zero. And Hashem said, Pinchas ben Elazar HaKohen, Eshivet Chamati, 
Thanks to him, people will stop dying. But without him, everybody here would die. So how do you... So I said in my speech back then in Hebrew, Zimri, what are you, an Orthodox Jew? Or you reform? What kind of a religious Jew bring a Goya into his house in front of the whole neighborhood? What, you became reformy? Reform? You became Bennett? That's what I say. You became Bennett? And everyone laughed. Just like now. So now they made an article. The famous rabbi that has hundreds of thousands of followers and serious influence on people here in Israel is calling to kill the Prime Minister of Israel, Bennett. You believe those lefties, how dumb they are? I don't know what they are more, dumb or crooks, or both. Such crooks. So he said to me, why you instigate against them? I said, because they are lefty traders. They claim that they are righties, they cheated their voters, and they went with the Muslim brother, and they destroying Israel. They are, the, they are more lefties than the lefties. I, I say, the fact that all of you now defending Bennett and Lieberman so much, when before you used to kill them and curse them non-stop, when they pretended to be righties, all of a sudden the media loves them so much, because they went with the Arab to destroy Israel, that shows that they are traitors, because the lefties never compliment a righty. Did you ever see the TV here give a compliment to Donald Trump, ever? No. Never. No matter what he would do, even if he would close a deal with some country for $300 billion profit to America, they will destroy him on the media. They'll find something to say. Yeah, they don't look for the truth. That's the way they are. Let's go back to our real topic tonight. So anyway, now Rabotai, Moshe went up to the mountain, he comes down in Yudzain Betamuz, that's why we're fasting in that day, because Moshe broke the commandments. After that, the next day on Yudchet Betamuz, he went up to the mountain again. And by then, he was in a mountain until when? Yom Kippur. The last 40 days from Rosh Chodesh Elul until Yom Kippur, Moshe was davening that Hashem would forgive us for the sin of the golden calf. On Yom Kippur, Hashem said to him, Salachti I forgive, forgive as you requested. And this day will be a day of repentance forever. Every year, Yom Kippur, a day of repentance, day of atonement. Moshe came down and it's written, Vayimim achorat hayom, vayeshev Moshe lishpot et ha'am. Moshe came down on Yom Kippur with the second commandments. And the oral Torah, because you cannot see the following day and judge the people if you don't have the oral law. Because all the judgment of bed din in any topic, it's all come from the oral law. Nothing comes from the written Torah. The written Torah only have the titles. But how to do, what to do, all the instructions is all Torah Shebaal Peh, written oral Torah. So we learn from here that on Yom Kippur, Moshe brought the second commandment because the first one were broken before we even got them. And the oral Torah, and what part of the written Torah he brought on Yom Kippur when he came down? What part of the written Torah? The entire written Torah? Part of it? None of it? What do you think? No? What's the answer? You see, nobody knows. Aseret Adibot, we already said, the Ten Commandments, the Second Commandment. That's Parashat Acharemot. What part of the written Torah Moshe brought? Nothing. You see what I'm talking about? You can be a religious Jew 80 years and you don't know anything from your life. You don't know the 13th principle of Judaism. You don't know the Ten Commandments. And you don't even know what Shavuot is. Don't know. Then one day you come to Hashem after a hundred years old, you stand for a trial, and all your grandparents come, and you see your grandson of Rashi, grandson of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, grandson of the Ramba maybe, grandson of all, you know, a lot of the names in the Gemara are all Persians, by the way, you should know that. 
even though we call the Gemara Talmud Bavli, at least half of it was in Iran, in the other side of the border. Many of the Chachamim, you can see their names are Persian, Ashi, Ravina, some of them were Persian names. Not everybody was in Iraq, in Bavel. So, many of the Persian Jews are grand-grand-grandchildren of Mordechai and Esther and Rashbi and Rabbi Akiva, all these names that you have in the Gemara. Imagine now you have a trial and they all come, you are my grand-grandson. Oh yeah, let's see what you know. Okay, Hashem said, did you set up time to learn Torah every day? No, Hashem, I was in uh, Manhattan every day, selling antique Persian rugs. No problem, it's no, not a crime to make a living. Do you know the Ten Commandments? I'm sorry, no. Do you know the 13 principles of Judaism? No. Do you know the, the orders of the parashot in the Torah? No. What do you know? How to sell rugs. That's it. That's all you know. And how to build mansions in Great Neck or in Beverly Hills. But I'm a very good builder. Hashem say, yeah, you are a very good builder. But building, buildings does not get you to heaven. That's the problem. This is just to make a living. That's why it's a crime in Judaism to be Amaretz and Amaretz Hasid, because Amaretz is a criminal. Because if you don't learn what you have to do every day, you commit a lot of sins. Maybe not intentionally, but you will be judged as intentional. Why? Because you don't come to learn. In other religions, it's not a crime to be an ignorant. You can be a total fool. You don't know how to read Arabic, you don't know Quran, you don't know anything. You're not a criminal. You ask the Imam and he'll tell you what to do. In Christianity, the same thing. You ask the Father, Father John, and he'll tell you what to do. In Buddhism, you ask some monk somewhere, tell me what to do, I'll tell you what to do. In a Torah, if you don't know what to do, you're not going to be able to ask the rabbi 5,000 times a day what to do. How to clean the leathers, how to clean the parsley, how to do this, how to do to, tefillin, mezuzot, talit, you got ripped, it's kosher, not kosher, there's thousands of things every month. What are you going to do? Are you going to have a pers private rabbi? On a one month for video call, keep the video call for a month that he will always tell you what to do, how to wash your hands, how to pray, how, if you have an emergency in the middle, when you're allowed to talk, when you're not allowed to talk. How are you going to know all this? You have to start learning Torah, Habibi. You don't learn, you declare as a criminal. Criminals pay a very heavy price when they come to the next world. Why? Because Hashem gave us His most precious gift, which is Torah, and you neglected it? Not to talk about those who put their life into sport and business and cars and all kinds of uh, art. Everything but Torah. No Torah in their life. No Torah in their house. Nothing. Some houses here worth $20 million. They don't even have a chumash. Houses over here of religious people. Forget secular. Secular, I understand, they don't have anything. People with yamaka, go to the house, you don't find one book. Maybe Sidur, if you're lucky. What are they going to say? I don't read Hebrew. You have uh, the Germesian Chumash in Farsi. That's, uh, you have no excuses. You have to do everything in Farsi. Right? Even my film, Torah and Science, I translated it for you, to you for Farsi. But not to read, because maybe some people don't read so good. So they mute my voice, and the guy speaks in f instead of me. Four hours Jewish seminar. One proof after the other that our Torah can never be given by a human being. Only the creator of the world. You have to be a rock not to become Baal Tshuva after you watch that film. A rock. You know what? Even the rock become religious. <laughs> It's so convincing, it leaves no doubt. Not because it's my film, it's not my material. I don't have a copyright on it. It's all from the Torah and the Gemara. You just have to know how to present it, that's it. But it's all, it was all there for thousands of years. So anyway, Rabotai, what part of the written Torah we got? The answer is, from Bereshit Bara Elokim, Tashamayim Vetaaretz, until Parashat Yitro. 
everything that already took place in history is written. Parashat Yitro, it's now. You're not going to write the future before it happened. Because imagine Korach opened the Torah and read that soon he's going to make a fight with Moshe and he's going to be buried alive. Korach reads the Torah. Moshe, what's in it? Let's go to Parashat Korach. Wow, there's a parasha after me. Wow, I'm so important. No, no, don't be happy. Read the rest. Wow, it's written that I'm coming to fight with you. Wow, oh my God. Uh, me and my whole family and everything is getting swallowed alive. That day I don't come out of my house. It's impossible. It's already written that you've been buried alive. You cannot have a mistake in a Torah. If you find one mistake in a Torah, it's not divine. That means you have no choice. You have to come and fight me and you have to die and be buried alive. Obviously, it's not, that's not what happened. Because Hashem does not decree on a person to be righteous or wicked like the Rambam writes in Ilchot Tshuva. There's no such thing. A person has complete free will to choose to be righteous or wicked in every transaction, not just in general. So we got the Torah until Parashat Yitro. And from Parashat Yitro until the end, until the end of the Torah, Vezot Haberacha, Le'ene Kol Yisrael, that's the last verse on, on the Torah. When did Moshe finish the Torah? The last day of his life. The last eight verses describe the death of Moshe. How did he write about his death? Did he write about his death knowing soon it's going to happen, any minute, God told me to finish the Torah, and I read how I'm going to die in an hour. Or, Yoshua ben Nun finished it after he died. That's an argument in the Gemara. Two opinions. One opinion that Moshe was writing it with tears, that he, he writes about his end that will happen any minute, as soon as he finished the Torah. And one opinion is, no. Moshe did not finish the last eight verses. Yoshua Hashem told him, finish the last eight verses about the death of Moshe. To me, if you ask my opinion, I would think that Moshe wrote it with tears for one reason, because it says right after that that he wrote 13 Sifre Torah. And he gave one to each tribe, and it was all done by a miracle, you know. And he gave one to each tribe, and one he puts in an in a ark, in a coffin, as a, as a testimony. And if, if Yoshua finished it, then we have to say that Yoshua finished 13 Sifre Torah multiplied by 8 verses. Right? That we will have to say such thing, which will be 104 verses. That's already much longer to write. Either way, it can happen. But that's it. So what, now we know, every few years Hashem called Moshe to oil Moed and told him to write another part in the Torah. But which part? Things that happened already. They will not eliminate the, f the future free choice, free will. And that's how we got the Torah. In that case, please answer me why we call Shavuot Chag Matan Torah. It should have been Chag Ma'amad Ar Sinai. You understand what I'm asking or no? It should have been the holiday of the event of Mount Sinai. Because we didn't get the Torah. The answer is, the original plan was to give us the Torah then. With, without what happened, that they all died and the Moshe had to go up to the mountain and they did the golden cap, all these things, it's because of their choices. We should have got the Torah, that was the plan. There was a delay, unexpected delay, because of their behaving. Because the seed was already put in the ground, you already call it an orange juice. Even there's no oranges there, right? There's no oranges on the tree. But you know in a year, you're going to be able to get a lot of oranges. So what do you call it? Orange tree. But it's only very small. Very small, in a, you know, it's not even one foot. How do you call it? Orange tree. But there's no oranges. By the way, I know someone who planted an orange tree and a lemon tree in Israel. The lemon tree gives tons of lemons, and the orange tree already four years did not give one orange. And it bloomed beautiful. Nice, thick, green, wide. Not one tree. I don't know. 
It's very interesting. Maybe it takes longer to oranges to begin to grow, who knows? Maybe it's a barren tree, also possible. Now I'm going to read to you two beautiful midrashim, which is the main topic tonight. I don't know if you ever heard it before, but it's important to know it at least once in your life. And I suggest that even after we finish, you will listen again to this lecture in a follow-up, in a recording. And like this, you will be able to memorize it, or at least some of it. But before I read you those two midrashim, I want to tell you how the Torah is written. Pay attention. 54 chapters in the Torah. 54 parashiyot. In each chapter you have few mini chapters. Prakim. How many all together in the Torah? 187 mini chapters. How many verses you have in the Torah? 5,000. 845 verses. 5,845 verses. How many words you have in the Torah? That's letters. How many words? 81,404 words. How many letters you have in the Torah? 304,805. 304,805 letters. So now we know how the Torah is written. From now on, let's see the, the words of the Midrash. It's fascinating. When Moshe went up to heaven, to accept the Torah, the angels, what does it mean, Malachi Asharet? The servicing angels, the servants of Hashem, told God, Ribbono Shalolam, Master of Universe, how is it possible that a person that was born from a woman is here among us? Meaning we are all created by you. We were not born, we're not material. How do you let someone, human being, that was born from, from parents to come here to this area? He doesn't belong here. Hashem said he came to accept the Torah. The angel claimed the Torah is the most precious thing to you, God. You have it already for 974 generations before you created the world. The Torah was the blueprint of the world. Based on the Torah, you build the world. You looked at the Torah and based on the, uh, the descriptions of the Torah, you build the world. Why would you give it to a, to a people? Right? How the angels knew that it's 974 generations? Because it's written in Tehilim 105, verse 8, that, that it says, Torah, Dor. Hashem commanded his word for thousand generations, 974 generations before the creation of material, this material world, and 26 generations from Adam until we got the Torah. Who were the 26 generations? From Adam until Noah, 10 generations. Read in the Torah, who gave birth to who? 10 generations. Then, we have, then we have the, from, from uh, Noah to Abraham, ten generations. And then from Abraham to Moshe Rabbeinu, we have Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Levi, Ke'at, Amram, six generations, and now we're receiving the Torah. So 26 generations from the creation until Muhammad al Sinai, plus 974 before the world was created, which is very hard to understand how you count 974 generations when there was no material. That's a big mystery. What does it mean? It has to be a big secret here. 
974. Some says that, you know, Hashem created worlds and destroyed them. That's what's written in Kabbalah. How many worlds Hashem created? How many worlds? All together, seven worlds with our world. And each world was for 7,000 years. Seven times seven, like Shemitah. Every six years, the seventh year is Shemitah. That's one world. So seven times seven, what comes after seven times seven? Yovel. Which coming now soon. Because we are about to finish the 6,000, right? In 220 years from now. 218 years from now. That's the end of this world, meaning we're going into the 7,000. After days of Mashiach, Gogumagog, resurrection of the dead, 1,000 years living here without, without Yetzirara, without even inclination. With all the righteous people came back to life. By the 7,000, which is 100, which is 1,218 years from now, 1,218 years from now, it will be the finish of the seventh world. And now it will be the 50th, which is Yovel. That will be Olam Abba, the eternal world. That the souls will separate again from the body and go to the eternal world and that's it. No more material worlds, no more destroying worlds, creating worlds. So, there's all kinds of things written about these seven worlds that Hashem created and finished, created and finished. We are actually the last one. Based on this concept, you have the Hasidut Chabad. Chabad started by a big rabbi, Rabbi Baal Atanya. Baal Atanya, 200 and something years ago. Then he has another rabbi after him, and another one, and another one, and another one, until the final, the last Schneorson, Rabbi Schneorson, the final Chabad Rebbe. Why they do not nominate a new Rebbe? Every time a Rebbe passed, a different Rebbe, like a king, king passed, somebody else take the kingdom. Why after Rabbi Schneorson, which is about 30 years from now, they did not nominate any rabbi? It's Hasidut without a Rebbe. All other Hasidiyot, as soon as the Admor pass, immediately they announce who is the new Rebbe. By them they refuse to announce. Why? Because according to their belief, there will be only seven Rebbes and the last one will be the Mashiach. So if you're going to nominate an eighth one now, you actually defeat the entire belief and make it a false belief. Unfortunately, what can you do when you see that the seventh one was not the Mashiach because he passed away? And in Agmara, Rabbi Akiva admitted that Bar Kuchva, that everybody thought that he's a Mashiach, once he passed, they changed his name to Bar Koziva, not Kuchva. His original name was Bar Kuchva. Why did they change his name to Bar Koziva? Koziva comes from the word Achzava, disappointment. We all got disappointment, disappointed when he died, knowing we thought that he's Messiah, but we were disappointed because once he died, that's it. He cannot be the Mashiach. So, Baruch Hashem, some of the Chabad got the point and they realized once the Rebbe passed, that's it, he wasn't the Mashiach. He was potentially, possibly could have been, but now it's not going to be. Some of them refuse to admit. So no, no, he's going to resurrect from the dead. He's still going to be the Messiah. You know, it's a very sensitive and long uh, argument. The Rambam brings six conditions that how you know who's the Messiah. One of the conditions is that he will gather all the Jews into Israel and build the third temple. And in that time, no one will ever bother the Jews anymore. In his time, with all the respect to the Lubavitch Rebbe who did a lot in the world and made a lot of thousands of, of uh, Batei Chabad and sent many people to spread Judaism and did a lot of wonderful things in his days, but he did not gather all the Jews into Israel. You cannot argue with that. He himself never even been in Israel. 
I asked once why the Rebbe did not visit Israel. We ordinary religious people went to Israel many, many times. We're very excited to visit the Holy Land. We go to the Kotel, to other places. Why such a holy man did not go to Israel once? And the good answer I got was that once you go to Israel, it's not so simple that you can ever leave Israel. Because it's written in Shulchan Aruch, only three reasons that you're allowed to leave Israel for. One is to learn Torah in a higher quality overseas. If you don't have enough level in Israel, you're allowed to go overseas if you have a bigger rabbis to teach you. Okay. What's the second reason? To marry a woman. You cannot find a shiduch in Israel. Nobody wants you. You waited 10 years, now one girl wanted you, and now they offered you some cousin of yours. You know, some nice Persian girl, she wants you, and you have to go overseas, and you have saw her pictures and everything, you know, the family. So, you know, it's basically a done deal. Not to go to America now and starting to look for Shiduch. For that is no permission to leave Israel. Only if there's something serious waiting. Oh, so for that you're allowed to leave. Also to release a Jew from prison. The Goim capture him. They want bail or money, bribe to release him. It's mitzvat pidyon shvuim. You're allowed to go and take care of releasing him. That's why you're also allowed to go and chase a villain that left Israel and left his wife without a get. And now she's going to be miserable for the rest of their life, unable to get remarried, because this villain is hiding somewhere in a different country, making her aguna. So going to search for him and hunt him and get the get out of him, it's pidyon shvuim. She's a prisoner of him. So for that you're allowed, and that's why some rabbis from the Rabbaniot in Israel, they come here and they do that, or in other countries. And some say, not according to all opinion, that the fourth reason you're allowed to leave Israel is to sell your merchandise. Meaning, let's say you're a diamond dealer in Israel and there's a big reception, reception over there, recession, I'm sorry, and nobody can afford your 10, 10 carat diamond, it's worth over a million dollars. No one in Israel has this kind of money. You have a few important precious stones, and the only place you can sell them is in Dubai, or Geneva, or Beverly Hills, places that people have money. So now some say, not everybody agree with that, that since there's no chance to sell them in Israel, you cannot sell your merchandise in Israel, therefore you're allowed to go overseas, sell it, and come back. That's it. Four reasons. Now, if the Rebbe would come to Israel, according maybe to his opinion, that's what I was told. I don't know if it's the real reason. Maybe there's other reasons. I don't know. But I was told by one Talmid Chacham Chabadnik. Now, once you go, there's no permission to return. Why? What reason you have? You have Torah in Israel higher than America. You married already, so you don't, you don't have a reason to go out to find a woman. And you don't have any merchandise to sell. And you don't have any prisoner to redeem. So once you get to Israel, you're stuck there. That's it. You're stuck there and you have to rebuild your life there. Maybe that's what he was holding. That's why he never even came to Israel. So he not only didn't collect all the people from the world to come to Israel and build the third temple, he himself never visited Israel. So that's why we're stuck now after his passing from the world. By the way, if you are next to the Chabad Messianic, those who have the, the, the riding on their yamakas, Yechi Adonenu, Morenu, Verabenu, you know those yamakas that they ride? They believe the Rebbe never passed. One time I sat and ate with them. They, they are next door to where I speak in Brooklyn. And Baruch Hashem, they know how to enjoy life. They have a lot of hilulot. There's all kinds of parties that they make. What is this? The Rebbe did this and this. So today it's a special day. No, yalla, barbecue, some good whiskey. So they, they, I'm already finished, I'm exhausted after three hours lecture, midnight. Come, come, sit with us. It va'adut. One time they asked me, no, yalla, give dvar Torah. <laughs> so I started to give dvar Torah and I say, I got a, co a silver coin from the Rebbe before he passed with a picture of 770 building, 
as soon as I say before we pass, 20 messianic chabad, you have to see like tigers, how they jump from their chair, hey, hey, ne'elam me'enenu, don't say niftar, oh, it almost stoned me, don't say pass, disappeared from our eyes, <laughs> meaning he's hiding himself, Baruch Hashem. Seder. Let's go back to the Midrash. <laughs> Let's go back to this Midrash. So now the angels are fighting Moshe Rabbeinu to get the Torah. So Moshe say to Hashem, I'm very scared that they're going to burn me. Hashem say, hold my chair. Because now Moshe is in the seventh heaven. That's where the Kiseh Kavod. Hold my chair and answer them. Meaning, don't worry, I'm protecting you. Moshe answer. What's written in the Torah? I am the God that took you out of Egypt. Did you go to Egypt and were slaves there? So why you want the Torah? It's not relevant to you. Moshe continue. What else written there? You should not have any other God but me. Does angels have other God? You need to tell them not to have another God. They're with God every day. They know who is the God, right? So it's not relevant to you. It says you should not worship idols among the nations that you live there. You live among the nations that worship idols? No. What else is written there? Observe the Sabbath. Do you work in the six days of the week that you need a rest on the Sabbath? What else is written there? Do not carry, do not pronounce the name of God in vain. Do not swear on a false testimony. Any one of you has business that you have to come to bed in and swear in the name of God. It's also written you should not kill. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. Do you have Yetzirah? Do you have evil inclination and jealousy? Do we have to warn you not to kill? Any of that is relevant to you? Later it's written, when Moshe came down from the mountain, the Satan, the master of all the evil inclination, is also an angel, came to Hashem and said, where is the Torah? Hashem said, I gave it to the land. The Satan came down to the land and said, where is the Torah? The land said, we do not know. He went to the ocean, meaning the angel that is in charge of the land said, I don't know. He went to the angel who is in charge of all the water. I don't know. It's not by us. He went back to Hashem. He said, I could not find it. Hashem said, go to Ben Amram. Go to the son of Amram, Moshe. The Satan came to Moshe and said, where is the Torah? Moshe said, am, who am I that you're asking me such a question? Do I even, am I even worthy that to, to receive the Torah? Do you really think I'm the one who got the Torah? <laughs> Moshe. Hashem said to Moshe, are you a liar? Moshe say, how can I accept any credit for getting the Torah which is yours? Hashem said, because you're so humble and you don't want to take credit, from now on, the Torah will be named after you. As it's written in Malachi 3, verse 22, Zichru Torah Moshe Avdi. What's the name of the Torah? Not the Torah of God, the Torah of Moses. Torah Moshe. Moses Torah. Moses Torah. It's not called Bennett's Torah. Or Bernie Sanders Torah. It's written Moshe's Torah. Another Midrash, and we finish here. When Moshe went to the first heaven, remember there are seven heavens. I just told you what happened when he got to the seventh one. Now let's go a little bit reverse, rewind, and see what happened before he got to the seventh section. When Moshe went to the first heaven, he found, to the first level, he found groups of angels opening the Torah and reading the first day of the creation. And when they saw Moshe, they stopped and started to praise the Torah. How wonderful is the Torah? He went up to the second heaven. He found groups of angels are reading the second day of the creation. 
When they saw him, they stopped and they started to praise the nation of Israel and the Torah. He went to the third level. He found groups of angels reading the third day of the creation. They stopped and started to praise Jerusalem, the holiest city in the world. He went to the upper, to the fourth level, fourth heaven. He found Arelim, it's different kind of, of angels, reading the fourth day of the creation. They stopped and started to praise the Messiah, the Mashiach. He went to the fifth level. He found groups of angels reading about hell. How terrible it is for all the wicked people that ended up there. How they scream and how they suffer and the color of the fire and the darkness and the big hole and everything that happens to the wicked people. When he went to the sixth level, he found angels that are reading the six days of the creation. They stop and started to praise heaven. What's happening in heaven to the righteous people. And they are they requesting Hashem to give a share to every part of Israel in heaven. He went to the seventh section, the seventh heaven, the top one, the highest one. By the way, hell is also have seven layers, seven sections, one on top of the other. The lowest one, which is the worst one, is called Tachtit Aretz. Right? And there's Sheol, Titayaven, Bor, Bor is the top one. Each one is, one of them is Tzalmavet, all these words appear in Teilim, the names of the seven sections of hell. So it's very interesting. Seven heavens, one on top of the other, and seven sections in hell, one on top of the other. The deepest one in hell is the worst one. So the deeper you go, the worse he gets. The higher you go, the better he gets. Same thing in heaven. First heaven is less than the second. Second is less than the third. Seventh one is the highest. That's where God supposedly sits. It's of course metaphoric. He doesn't have an image. But that's where Kisea Kavod. So now Moshe goes up to the seventh section. And he finds all kinds of angel. Ofanim, wheels, srafim, full of fire. Very scary. Galgalim, malachet rachamim, malachet chesed, malachet tzedaka, malachet retet vezia. Different groups. Miyad achaz Moshe bekisei akavod. Moshe grabbed the chair of Hashem, started to shake from fear. They started to, to read the seven days of the creation. Yom HaShishi, we finish, right? Vayechulu HaShamayim Ve'aretz. That's the seven day of the creation. Heaven and earth completed and God rested. And they started to praise what? What they started to praise? Tshuva, repentance, above everything. The tshuva is above everything. To teach you that the tshuva, repentance, is so great that it gets all the way up to Kisea Kavod. All the way up. Shneemar, as it's written in Hosea 14, verse 2, Shuva Yisrael ad Hashem Elokecha. Return Israel all the way to your God. This is this Midrash. Baruch Hashem, now we're going to read this Midrash in Shavuot. We have Tikkun Lel Shavuot. Those of you will stay up as it's required at night. Ladies are not obligated, but if they will do that, it will be very nice. And uh, we're going to read this Midrash. After we read the certain parts of the Torah, you're going to see there is this Midrash, Moshe Alala Marum. I don't know if they have it with English translation. It's very important. We learn, try to be in a shul very early. The 11 is the latest you should get there, 11. Because you have until 5 in the morning, that's it. Shachrit starts before 5. So how many hours you have? 5, 5 and a half hours is not going to be enough. Then we have Zohar, we usually never finish the Zohar. We maybe if we're lucky, we begin it. The sum of the Zohar. Make sure you bring a thermos with some black coffee, strong one to keep you awake. 
and uh, try not to fall asleep. It's important. That's why I say Shabbat day, rest. Even those who normally don't like to sleep on Shabbat, they like to sit and learn. For this particular event, you sleep on Shabbat day, that like this, you don't fall asleep. Why it's important? Because it's very nice if you stay up all night and learn, but you come to Shachrit and you fall in the middle of Kriyat Shema, you fall asleep. Or in the middle of Shmona Esri, you can't focus, you lose more than you gain. In the middle of Kriyat Shema, you fall asleep with the tefillin. You know, here you don't have tefillin in this case, because it's Yom Tov, but in general, you know what I mean. You're not supposed to fall in, asleep in the middle of, of davening or in the middle of Kriyat Shema. Any questions for what we discuss here tonight before we finish? Anything? Everything clear? I made everything clear? What? Um, you said it was Tor Moshe, but does it say Tor Hashem Temimah? Right, we sing a song. Torat Hashem Temimah. You said it was, it was named after Moshe. It's, it has two names. The original name was Torat Hashem. But Hashem say from now on, my car is also your car. Two people own the car, no problem. The Torah is named after Moshe as well. Bezrat Hashem, you'll be a big tzaddik, it'll be named after you also. <laughs> no, any more questions from the lady section? Nothing over there, yes? Oh, you got up, that means it has to be serious. You never stayed up in Shavuot night? It sounds difficult. It sounds... It's not difficult at all. If you sleep during the day, you'll be very alert. You wake up, you go to Mincha, Kabbalat Shabbat. I mean, no, here it's Motzei Shabbat. So you have Arvit of Motzei Shabbat. And then you eat a small light meal and you're able to stay all night. You're right, if you're not going to sleep during the day, many people fall asleep in the middle of the learning. Chaval. They well, come. Hashem say, though, if he, if he asked, did you ever stay up at all training for Shavuot? And you tell and you tell him, say, no. Let's put it that way. You're asking if there's a punishment for not staying? The punishment, the punishment is that you miss a big reward of staying up all night and learn Torah because the Gzohar said that someone who stays up at night and learn Torah in general, not even on Shavuot, every night of the year, Chut Shel Chesed Mashuch Alav. A special divine mercy on him, on his head, all day, the entire year. Needless to say, the holiest night preparation that we got the Torah in the morning, basically it's not something you want to miss. Thank you for the question. Any more? Yes, please. So, so you mentioned that, uh, if, I, if, I, if I understood you correctly, that Shavuot itself is not a time we Torah. We still call it Chag Matan Torah because that was the original plan and that's when the seed was actually planted. Yeah, so that we all came to our Sinai. Not, so why not actually celebrate uh, Shavuot? On Yom Kippur? Together with fasting, you want to make a party? That's very good, you know? Great to do uh, on Shavuot. You don't have to serve any food, nothing. Mamash, you bring the guests. They all look at your beautiful face. Mamash, amazing. Yes. Ah. Yes. Yes. He went back again on Yudchet Betamuz. No, but there was no Torah yet. The Torah was only given on Yom Kippur, and then the next day Moshe started to judge the nation. They all came to Bedin, the Erev Rav. The Erev Rav, the Egyptians came to Bedin because they wanted their property back, all the jewelry, the clothing. They said, everyone here is wealthy except us. We came out of Egypt, you converted us, and they're not returning everything they borrow. 
So how did Moshe has the ability to judge them, Dine Mamonot, if he didn't have the oral Torah? So he had to have the oral Torah. You understand? Also, I, wanted, I want you to know, it's true that we got the Torah in Mount Sinai, meaning the, uh, eventually right after Mount Sinai. Before the Torah was given to us, it was already given to individuals. Noah had parts of the Torah because it's written that Noah knew which animals are pure and which animals are not pure. There's no way to know it without the oral Torah. And Adam and Abraham, Chazal say Abraham kept all the mitzvot, even rabbinical one, even Eruf Tavshilim. How did Abraham know how to make tzitzit? How did he know how to keep Shabbat? How did he know how to make tefillin? It's all oral laws. So you see that individuals already had Hashem's Torah. However, it became a public thing after Muhammad Ar Sinai. That's when officially we became Jewish. Until then we were the Hebrews. Ivrim, Avraham Ivri. What's Hebrew means? Ivri, one-sided. Meaning everyone is on one side of the world and Avraham is on the opposite side. Everyone is wicked idol worshippers and Avraham is righteous and he started monotheism. Meaning the belief in one God and not all kinds of idols and all kinds of fairy tales. Any more questions? Yes, please. I was just the men had the last year, had a leading dairy. I was told because they didn't know the halakha of Kashrut, the way to the Torah. Yes. But what you're saying is it was. First of all, it's not a minag of Ashkenazim, it's minag of Sfaradim as well. For years I used to teach that the reason we eat. Dairy on Shavuot is when when Moshe came down from the mountain, uh, we just found out that all the meat that we prepare for Yom Tov is not kosher. Today I know that it's incorrect. This teaching is incorrect, even though it's written in some books, and that's where I got it from. But it's incorrect. It cannot be correct for one simple reason. First, when Moshe went up to the mountain, he did not come down on Shavuot, he did not bring them the Torah on Shavuot, so they didn't have the Torah until, like I said, 120 days later. Plus, if we say that Avraham Avinu already taught Yitzhak and Yaakov, and they were keeping all the Torah, they obviously already knew what's kosher and what's not kosher. So why would the Jews prepare not kosher meat for Shavuot? What's the reason we eat dairy? It's a very good question. I don't know anymore. I thought I knew. But, uh, I, I mean, I see a lot of answers, but I could not accept any one of the answers to convince Mamash. Maybe that's, maybe that's, but why Eretz Zavat Chalav Udvash? Then you do it all year round. Why does it have to be on Shavuot? So if any one of you has a very good answer why we eat dairy on Shavuot, please spare some change with your body here. Everyone died. Everyone died. The Parchanish Matam. They all died. And then they pushed back their soul. Nobody could. Nobody. By the way, you know, it's written that Rata Shifcha Bayam, in the Exodus of Egypt, a, a woman cleaning lady, a, a servant, reached a level of the Prophet Yechezkel. Meaning. Everybody had prophecy. Also in Muhammad Ar Sinai, they reached the highest level you can reach with unity and holiness. But still they died. But they died because uh, it's written, Lo irani adam v'chai. Nobody can see God and stay alive. Even though here they didn't see him, they only heard him and they also died. Right? It's written, Nafshi yatsa bedabro. You know this verse? Nafshi, my soul came out when Hashem spoke. That's on this event. When Hashem spoke, every one of the Jews, their soul came out. Clinical death. It happens to people. They die and come back to life after a few minutes. Moshe. Except Moshe. That's why we call Moshe the master of all the prophets. Why? Because it's written in the Torah, Lo kam od navi ke Moshe. One of the 13 principles of Judaism to recognize Moshe as the master of all the prophets. But not what was unique about Moshe? All prophets got a prophecy from Hashem. Why should we rate them? 
one is better than the other. They all spoke divine words. The answer is all the prophets needed to go to sleep, doze up, doze out, and receive the prophecy. They could not stay awake and stand on their legs when Hashem spoke to them, except Moshe. Moshe was the only one that was able to stand alert, alive, awake, and speak to Hashem and receive a prophecy. That's why we use the word lo kam. Kam meaning is to stand up on your feet. Lakum. Lo kam od navi. Because otherwise we would say lo haya od navi ke Moshe. Aval we don't say lo haya, we say lo kam. Why? Because he was the only one that could stand on his feet, speak to Hashem and not faint. And not die. Right? It's written, Kilo irani adam v'chai. Nobody can see me and stay alive. Yes, but when we die, everybody see Hashem. But when they died, everybody see Hashem. Why? Shneemar lefanav ichreu kol yorde afar. Everyone who goes down to the ashes, to the sand, bow down to Hashem and see the light of the Shechina. And out of uh, passion, an excitement to see that unbelievable pure light, the soul like a magnet, vacuum out, and that's how the person died. That's what's written also in the Zohar. Yes? So there's, you see time and time and time again, and time 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 and position here, obviously, Aval, the main one was Moshe. Even though it's written, sometimes the Gemara asks, why sometimes it's Aaron and Moshe, sometimes it's Moshe and Aaron. You have to always say who is higher. So if Moshe is higher, say Moshe and Aaron always. Why sometimes Moshe and Aaron, sometimes Aaron and Moshe? The Gemara answer, Lelamdecha sheshneem shkulim. To teach you that they're both equal. Then the Gemara asks, how can they both be equal? The Torah is named after Moshe, Moshe spoke to the Shekhinah, Moshe went up to the mountain, Aaron did not go up to the mountain. So, obviously Moshe is higher than Aaron. So the answer is, when you compare between two righteous people, even though right now one looks higher than the other, it doesn't mean he's really higher. We go by how much from your potential you fulfill. So if your potential is to reach level 80, that's it. You can't get any higher. And your friend's potential is to get to level 60. He cannot go any higher. And he reached 50 out of 60. And you reach 65 out of 80. You are higher than him, 65. But you're not because you missed 15% of your potential. And he only missed 10% of his potential. So when they say Moshe and Aaron, Aaron and Moshe, the Gemara say it's to teach us that they both equal, meaning they both fulfill the maximum potential that they had. Even though when we now compare, Moshe is higher. But Aaron achieved the same achievement. Why? I, I reached the maximum I could. And you reached the maximum you could. Right? It's like two people have a container. And I go to the well to fill it up with water. One is 10 liter, one is 15 liter. They both filled it up to the max. So the father will be happy from both of them, even though one brought less water. He's not going to tell him, how come you only brought 10? So how, how can I bring more? I filled it up to the top. You understand? I did the maximum I could. Last question for today. Yes. Oh, I see all of a sudden a lot of hands, no? Very simple. When Moshe went up to the mountain, that's already after Hashem spoke to him in front of millions of people. When, Mo when Hashem came to Moshe in a burning bush, he was alone, one on one. He told, he told him, take your shoes off. Okay. Then he said, I would like to send you to Egypt to take out my nation out of Egypt. Moshe answered, they won't listen to me. And they won't believe me that you spoke to me. Meaning, what am I going to make myself look like a fool coming to the nation of Israel when they're in slavery and tell them, hey, 
You're lucky they arrive. I'm Moshe, your savior. I gotta throw tomatoes in my face. Get out of here, what are you, uh, lunatic, telling us now all these things. We have patience for you. No one will take me serious. So the answer of Hashem could have been, be quiet and do what I tell you. Why are you making questions here? I told you to go, go. He, got, he should have got angry at him. No. Hashem agree with this question. Hashem said to him, don't worry. I will gather, you will gather them in a mountain, around the mountain, and I will come down and speak to you in front of them. And after that, they will believe in you for eternity. Right? That's exactly what Hashem say, and that shows you that the only way to start a religion is when all the receivers of the religion witness the contact between God and the leader. Otherwise, you have no obligation to believe him. So if Moshe would come and pretend that he had a dream, we could tell him, just go and play with your fairy tale somewhere else. The fact that we all witness what he said, and we read in the Torah all the miracles that happened to us, and we actually witness that, we cannot, we cannot go wrong. Don't forget also, it's written, Moshe Yedaber, Ve'elokim Ya'anenu Bekol. Moshe speaks, and God answering him with voice. Why do you have to write with voice? When I answer you, it's with voice. No, not always. It could have been that Moshe gathered them to the mountain, and he said, dear God, I'm listening. Shh. Pretend he's listening. Okay, God told me to do such and such. Nobody else witnessed that. That's a pretending. Okay, the nation answer, Hashem, tell me what you think to answer them. Okay, Hashem, say such and such. That will be a very serious problem. That's why the Torah had to specify, Moshe, Daber, Ve'elokim, Ya'anenu, Bekol. God answered with a loud voice, and everybody listened and heard. And they all agreed to accept the Torah. I'll give you an example. If I'm pretending to be a prophet, and I sat a week in my house and wrote a book. And now I came to all of you and I give you the book. And I say, oh, it's written in my book. I am the messenger of God. He gave me this book. I'm the prophet. I'm your leader. All of you have to listen to me. Don't mess with me. Here is the Torah. And you open the book and, you, and this is what it's written. I am the God that brought you from Iran into Japan. I'm sorry, you brought us to America, not to Japan. Uh, can I tell you now, that convince you that you are in Japan now? Can I convince you that I'm giving you bread from heaven if it doesn't really happen every day? Can I convince you that I opened the Red Sea if it never happened to you? It's written over here that I opened the Red Sea for all of you. If it never happened, you tell me just get lost. You and your nonsense. Don't waste our time, right? If I get lucky to stay alive, it would be a miracle. If one lie would be in a book, they'll kill Moshe. You know why? I'll tell you why. Because Moshe now came and told all of them that they have to divorce their wives, some of them, because their wife is their aunt. Your brother, sister, you married her. Let's say your brother is 42 and you are 20. You're going on Shiduchim. Your brother, which is 42, has a young sister. She's 19, the youngest in the family. She's your aunt, technically. She's your father's sister, but she's younger than you. You were allowed to marry her before the Torah was given. No problem. So now you marry her, you have 10 kids. Come, Mr. Moshe ben Amram, ladies and gentlemen. It's written in Parashat Acharemot. In Arayot, we read it on Yom Kippur, in Mincha. It's written, Ervad dodatcha lo tegale. You're not allowed to touch your aunt. Can I have intimacy with her? So now your marriage is over. Thousands of people started to cry. What do you mean? Well, I'm not going to be able to be with my wife now, just because she's my aunt. Why didn't you say it before? You want to hear the best part? Who was Moshe's father? Amram. Who was his mother? Yochevet. Yochevet was the end of Amram. <laughs> Moshe would make up some, something against his own parents. 
or against innocent thousands of holy people after what they suffer in Egypt, just make up such a lie and force people to divorce and broke thousands of family. Even Bennett wouldn't do such thing. <laughs> he does other things, but I don't think Bennett would enjoy breaking 20,000 families. So what, Moshe is worse than Bennett? You got the point? Thank you very much. We'll see you again.